Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text for today's sermon comes from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Him that is Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to, pro to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks, that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall a jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Here are the words. We pray that the Holy Spirit bless our study upon these words. I would like for you to recall the story of David and Goliath. Goliath was about nine feet, nine inches tall, carried an intimidating spear, and hung the fate of the Israelites' freedom onto one-on-one -on -one combat. Considering this classic uh, Old Testament story and character of Goliath, we sometimes hear the term in our, in our society or lives, Goliath-sized problem. What exactly is a Goliath-sized problem? It's when the odds are most definitely not in your favor. It's when a certain situation seems doomed from the start because of a seemingly huge opposition or problem. What are some examples of a Goliath-sized problem? On a personal level, it can be things like financial debt. How am I going to pay off these mortgage payments? It can be a serious medical diagnosis. I'm sorry to tell you this, but you have stage four cancer. It can be a number of different things on a personal level. On a group level, it can be a national crisis, such as the COVID-19 outbreak. It can be church family related, such as the wonder of how our small church body, the Church of the Lutheran Confession, is going to stay afloat. These Goliath-sized problems, personal or group, may seem impossible to overcome. But let me put the emphasis on the word seem. For with man, nothing is possible. But with God, all things are possible. What we have in our Old Testament reading this morning is a seemingly Goliath-sized issue. There was a drought in the land, which was actually prophesied by Elijah the king Ahab a few chapters earlier. This national issue took effect on the people's lives because there was no water to drink or to help grow crops. One person's life who was particularly affected was the life of the poor widow who lived in the small town of Zarephath. She had just enough provision so that she would be able to make one last meal for her and her son. You see, there was no rain for a long time, and as you know, this would most definitely lead to a shortage of food. There would be barely anything to purchase, and what there was to purchase was probably in high demand. So how could a poor widow possibly survive in such trying times as these? She saw this Goliath-sized issue at hand and embraced what would seem to be her and her child's demise. This issue was huge and it only grew bigger in her eyes when Elijah asked to be fed as well. So you see, even back about 3,000 or more years ago, Goliath-sized issues existed. In fact, one may say that they happen more often then than they do nowadays. All these Goliath-sized issues from the fall into sin to now stem from that 
very issue of sin. This widow's plight came from sin entering the world, and so do our plights as well. This giant issue of sin is the reason for all our great distresses, personal or larger scale. Sin is the reason why all these giant issues crop up. The mistakes of others and mess ups of ourselves are to blame for our problems growing so large. And after they grow large enough, it can be rather easy to speak along the same lines of the widow and say, I'll do what I can, but that's all I can do. These mistakes and mess ups also affect our spiritual plight or plight with God, as well as our physical and mental problems on earth. You see, because of our transgressions, sins, mistakes, whatever you refer to them as, we had a Goliath-sized problem with God. In this issue, it's even worse than the widow of Zarephath. At least she could have one more meal and moment with her son before she died. With the issue involving our sin, we had nothing. And all we could say was, I have nothing, and I will surely die for what I've done. Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. So Elijah says to the widow, do not fear. Is this guy serious right now? The land is undergoing a serious drought, and I just told him that I had no food. This could have been the widow's thought, but Elijah carries weight behind his do not fear. He is a prophet, simply relaying the promise of mercy, which comes from the all-loving Lord. The Lord promised to replenish the widow's ingredients until rain was sent upon the land. And this certainly did happen according to the word of the Lord. The Lord promised mercy to this poor widow, and her childlike faith simply held on to this promise which the Lord gave. He promised mercy toward her lot of poverty. All throughout the Bible, in several places, the Lord promises mercy to individuals, earthly strife. And they could be sure of it because they had the word of the Lord. Just a little earlier in the time of Elijah's ministry, the Lord promised to Elijah that he would be fed properly. And the Lord did so through the use of ravens in the brook. Elijah certainly saw that mercy and was told to share the same merciful promises with the widow. Elijah had that merciful promise of earthly provision, but that doesn't even come close to the whole scope of God's mercy. Elijah would later see a fuller version of God's mercy when the fiery chariots of heaven would return or would come down to take him home. All this mercy and love showed toward Elijah, the widow, you and me, culminated in the one most merciful and saving act of all, which was certainly according to the word of the Lord. This act was the mercy of Jesus acting as our substitute on the cross and taking upon himself the wrath of God. So take a look back to our former state. We have nothing, and we should surely die. But Jesus gave us everything and died for us. This drought and plague of sin, which invokes the wrath of God, has us pleading for mercy. Thankfully, the Lord has shown us mercy according to his word, which reads, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. This mercy is truly wonderful, and it endures forever. When you say the common table prayer with your families, you acknowledge that the Lord is good and that his mercy is eternal. From age to age, God has shown his mercy to his people. From Old Testament times, to the early church, to Martin Luther's day, to our grandparents, parents, and even our day. God has always been doing this. He is merciful. This is a reminder that the love and mercy of our Lord Jesus will be bountiful and never dry up. To the older people watching us, from your youth through your prime years, all the way up to now, the Lord Jesus has never let his mercy run out or dry up. And when you pass from this earth to the next, the Lord Jesus will be there to say, take my hand, for I have brought you home. To the younger who are viewing, God has a plan for you, and that plan is filled with mercy. That plan is different for each and every one of us, and the road may not be easy. 
But the mercy comes from Jesus, having taken upon the most difficult part of our journey, for he took upon himself our sinfulness. We are now completely forgiven and will no longer die because of the because of this merciful sacrifice of Jesus' death on the cross. So, young and old alike, next time you say the common table prayer, think of the phrase, for his mercy endures forever. The Lord is merciful and has shown it by Jesus' death on the cross and death in our place. He has taken upon himself our, diso our disobediences against God, and now we won't die but will be carried through our lives up to our eternal home in heaven. This mercy endures forever. He will not leave us nor forsake us. His love will not dry up or run out. We can carry this fact throughout our lives. We do not need to fear. Elijah and the widow put aside these fears because of their faith in their merciful Lord and Savior. When Elijah told the widow not to fear, but to simply make a meal, for the Lord will provide. The widow in simple childlike faith did as the prophet commanded. She was fearing for her and her son's life, but she had the word of the Lord to create and sustain her faith in God. Also look at Elijah for this as an example. The Lord told him to find this widow for he would feed him. And Elijah so did in simple childlike faith. But did Elijah also have moments of fear? Well, yes, of course. A chapter later, Elijah would say to the Lord that he believes that he is the only God-fearing man alive, and now his life is in danger. But the Lord would reassure him that there are others who fear the Lord as well. And he would, he would assure Elijah with the still, small voice of his word. So this word of the Lord is what we have to take us through our lives especially for distressing situations. This word of the Lord creates and sustains the childlike faith in us, and this faith clings to the merciful sacrifice of Jesus' death on the cross. This word is what we have to carry throughout our lives. This Lord, the Lord shows us his mercy in his holy word. Whatever distressing situation we may be in, we know that all things work together for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. It all works together for good. Because of Jesus Christ, God has shown mercy upon you. You will not die and be cast into hell. For yes, we go through struggles in this life, and we know that we will physically die in the end, but we know the gracious end that awaits us because of what Jesus Christ has done for you and me. So go on and carry his word throughout life, for this is what strengthens us. It is our assurance in the Lord's mercy. So what's the distressing problem in your life? Is it debt, disease, family matters, the news or media? Whatever it may be, these problems stem from the biggest problem of all, and that's sin. We, can, we could go away thinking that this world is very evil. We are very evil, and we surely die from all this. We have mercy, though, and the Lord assures us of that in his word. Come to me, all you who are weak and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the mercy that the Lord shows us, and it is because of Jesus' merciful sacrifice. So in the face of death, disease, debt, or any byproduct of sin, we can laugh away. For we have the assurance of the Lord's mercy written in his word. And this mercy will neither dry up nor run out. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.